Okay. Uh, this is an interview with Kenneth Carlson, Comfort Inn, Brooklyn, New York. It is the 18th of March, 2003, uh, approximately 10.50 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Uh, could you give us your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Kenneth Rudolph Carlson, born in New York City, last house on a dead-end street. This is north of Hell's Kitchen on January the 28th. 1921. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? I was very fortunate. Even though I uh, came from a middle class family, I was able to attend uh, the best private school in New York, which is the Collegiate School. It's 375 years old. And it was attached at that time to the uh, Collegiate Dutch Reformed Church, mm -hmm. the minister of which was uh, Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote The Power of Positive mm -hmm. Thinking. And so I was able to walk from a dead end street up eight blocks and go to a private school. And I had a, uh, a terrific education, uh, even though I had to fight my way home through the Irish gangs on 69th Street when I came back from school. Okay, um, do you remember where you were and what your reaction was when you heard about Pearl Harbor? You never forget it, based upon what, you, what decision you made. Uh, my father had uh, died in 1939 unexpectedly when I was 18, and the only asset that he had was a, a brownstone home on a uh, house on 73rd Street in Lexington Avenue. And so I had my mother and my grandmother to support, and we lived on the fourth floor of a tenement walk up. And it was a Sunday, and I was in the front room. They lived in the, or slept in the back room, listening to the radio. And I was listening as a former athlete to the giant. Dodger football game. And somewhere during that game, there was an announcement that uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And even though I had a great education, I wasn't sure where Pearl Harbor was. As a matter of fact, I, I felt it was in the Philippines. So that's how I found out, and that's where I was, listening to a football game. Uh -huh. What was your reaction something. to this news? Uh, Probably un unbelievable, both from the standpoint that uh, though I was well educated and knew the problems that we'd had with Japan over the last four or five or six years, uh, that this could not have happened. That there's no way it could have happened. So I was, you know, there was no television, there was nothing else was to wait for other radio reports and then to read about it in the newspapers the next day. So it really didn't make that big an impression on me. I had no idea what the magnitude of this bombing was until a day later. Did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. Um, why did you select the Air Corps? Well, that's an interesting story. It took me a couple of days to, to think through and to read and to see uh, both of the newsreels, uh, what really had happened, the damage that had been done, and what, what really was going on, and how that related basically to the war in Europe. So we never declared, uh, <coughs> you know, we declared war on Japan. But this is when young people talk about negotiation today. The fact was the Japanese were negotiating in Washington, D.C. when the surprise attack took place. Two days later, and I'm partly German, Swedish, American, the Germans declared war on America. And that made my decision to go, into, and to, go to war. Why did I pick the Air Force? I guess because my father had taken me to see uh, Charles Lindbergh take off when I was seven years of age to fly across the Atlantic and being Swedish American, why that was a, a hero figure for me. And then secondly, with my education, I understood about Billy Mitchell and I understood the power of the Air Force and how it was going to be the future of any, any war. And so in my own mind, I decided the best thing I could do would become a fighter pilot and to shoot down uh, the Japanese who had attacked uh, attacked us. So two days later I made that decision and enlisted in the Air Force. Had you ever flown? Never. Never flown. Okay. Uh, well, could you tell us uh, about your military experiences then from the time you went to boot camp? Yes, I can. All the way through, please. When I enlisted, uh, I uh, was just about to be married. I was 20 years of age, about to be 21. I was married at 21. And the Air Force uh, did not call me until January of 1943. So it was almost, it was a little more than a year before I was called to active duty. And the reason for it was that they had 
very limited training facilities. So in January of 43, I got on a train and uh, had orders to report to Nashville, Tennessee, which was a reception center and a classification center. And when I got there, I, they took away my civilian clothes and gave me a uniform that was two sizes too big, a GI uniform, because at that time you were enlisted as a private, $21 a month, until you were accepted as an Air Force cadet. And that meant you had to qualify for either being a pilot, a navigator, or a bombardier. Classification, because my mathematics skills at collegiate school was, was a gift and a talent and were so good, that even though I qualified to be a pilot, they wanted me to become a navigator. I uh, didn't want to do that. In my own psyche, it was fighter plane and uh, sh shooting down Japanese. But when they told me that I would have to wait maybe six months to nine months to be accepted into pilot training, whereas if I was accepted into navigation training, I could go immediately. I accepted navigation. So I had really no feeling for bombers. I had no idea where that was going to take me, but. They sent me then to San Marcos, Texas, which was a uh, navigation school. And it had just opened. It was outside Austin, between San Antonio and Austin. And uh, there I underwent six months of uh, navigation training. In August of 43, I was commissioned a second lieutenant. And from there assigned to Boise, Idaho, which was, would be where the crew would be assembled. Navigators went from the navigation school, bombardiers went from the bombardier school, pilots went from pilot training. And when I got to uh, Boise, I uh, found very quickly who my pilot was. And it turned out that he was, became my best friend and was just an unbelievable pilot. He was a small guy and uh, his parents were Czechoslovakian immigrants. His father was a bartender in Hollywood. And uh, all he wanted to do was fly. And he didn't drink, he didn't carouse, he was single. And uh, from there, I met my co-pilot met my bombardier, then met the six enlisted men that became the engineer, the radio operator, and the gunners. From that, and by the way, uh, my pilot's instructor at Boise, Idaho, was Jimmy Stewart, the actor, oh, no. who later became a commanding officer uh -huh. of a B-24 group, uh, group in the 8th Air Force, where I was later stationed. So then we were transferred to a new air base, which is in Mountain Home, Idaho, south of Boise. And it had the longest runway then in existence, and that's where we did uh, our original uh, crew training. From Mountain Home, we then were assigned to Wendover, Utah. Wendover, Utah was a little town uh, 100 miles west of Salt Lake City at the end of the Salt Flats, right on the Nevada border. And on one side, where we lived, uh, when we lived off the base, on one side there was a place called the State Line Hotel. And on the Nevada side, everybody was drinking, gambling, and, and, and doing anything they wanted to do. And on the other side, because of the Mormon influence, it was ice cream sodas and, uh, and go to bed early. So this is where we learned how to uh, operate as a bombing crew, Wendover, Utah. Wendover later became the training base and the secret base for the crew that uh, dropped the atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. When we... Uh, the scary part about training in those days <coughs> was the fact that so many of us uh, had, had learned to do things individually, but were hard-pressed hard to find a way to do it together. This was the training thing. That we lost a lot of airplanes, both through maintenance and through false navigation and pilot error, into the surrounding mountains of, uh, of Nevada. So we experienced losses. Uh, right then in training and understood that uh, not everybody was going to go down because of enemy fire. Uh -huh. After we completed that training, we were then sent to Harrington, Kansas, where we would pick up our own airplane and fly it to where it was ordered to fly. In Harrington, Kansas, the thing I remember most sitting in the room while Joe Rosnes, who was the pilot and captain of the crew, signed a piece of paper that said he was responsible for a B-24J, which is a four-engine Liberator bomber, J signifying that it was a late model, which had a turret in the front with two machine guns rather than just two flexible machine guns that the navigator shot. 
and that he signed a paper for $250,000 worth of government property and would return it. And the question was, what if, what if we don't come back? <laughs> and they said, don't worry about it. When we picked up the plane, said goodbye to our wives, girlfriends, five of us were married, by the way, five were single. We were given orders to fly it to West Palm Beach, Morrison Field. And that was just to the west of, of uh, the enclave of Palm Beach and the fancy wealthy set. When we got there, our passes were taken away and we were confined to the field, awaiting orders to see where we would be sent. At that time, we were all hoping that we would be going to the South Pacific and that we would be, quote, killing Japanese. When we went down the runway and opened our orders, and our destination then was the southern route, we were, going, we were given orders that we were, and I, as a navigator, had to plan the southern route, which took us into Trinidad, uh, the Guianas, Brazil, and then over to uh, Africa. When we read the orders going down, the orders were to report to the 8th Air Force, which was headquartered in England. So we knew then that we were not going to be killing Japs, we were going to be killing Nazis. The trip over, I don't know whether you want me to get into that, but the trip over was really a, was a, an unbelievable experience. It took us 45 days because there were weather delays all along the route. And remember, this is the first time that I had ever left the United States of America. As a matter of fact, having grown up in New York City, the only places really that I had been were Maine, where I had worked briefly in the mill, fell in love uh, with the Maine people, upstate New York, Long Island, and one trip to uh, Cincinnati. So this was the first time, really, that this city kid was about to see the world. And the thing that I remember most is when we got to Brazil, uh, in the, and we were in three towns, St. Louis, Brazil, um, uh, Fortaleza, Brazil, and Natal, Brazil, before we flew to Africa, was the tremendous poverty and disease and filth. Now, I had worked as a loan investigator, and, and I had covered Brooklyn, where we are here, and the uh -huh. waterfront, but I had never, never come across the type of poverty and the type of disease and the filth that I saw as we came to these small towns in Brazil. People were, you know, young people were walking naked, they were going to the bathroom in the streets. Uh, there were people carrying their, uh, uh, men carrying their testicles and, and handmade uh, wheelbarrows due to uh, elephantitis, a disease I had never heard about. So that was the big shock. When we left Fortaleza, this was the moment of truth, because now I was going to be responsible as a navigator with celestial advertising, we had no radar or, uh -huh. or, or radio like that, was to see whether I could take this trip across the South Atlantic, which was over 11 hours, and uh, arrive at the point that I was supposed to arrive at. And so that memory became a very uh, dramatic memory that is with me still to this day, of being alone. Uh, in the front of that airplane, in front of the engines, in the nose, with my sextant, which is an instrument to shoot the stars so you can plot your fix. The stars were so bright over the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, and you felt so alone and so at peace at the same time, you had this tremendous worry about, do you know where you really are as you look down at that ocean? And so as I would plot these fixes, which would show where, according to the stars, I was, that's when I learned that I was not on the course that I had planned. And so now the moment of truth was, do you accept that as the fact and correct it? Or do you pretend that maybe you didn't shoot the stars correctly and you stay on the course? And I decided to do what I'd been taught, which was to correct for the locations that the stars told me where I was. And in doing so, 11 hours and some odd minutes later, uh, far on the horizon, there was Africa, and there was Dakar, and we were on target, and we landed, and everybody thought I was just terrific. <laughs> Five of them thought that because they couldn't swim, and all they could think about, we were going to run out of gas before we got to Africa. <laughs> then the next, and there again, it was the, it was the poverty. And the fact that uh, so many of these young people were pimping their own young sisters who were, you know, pre-teens almost, uh, to make a living 
from all of the people who were transferring and going through there, whether they were sailors or whether they were Air Force people or whether they were American or British or Dutch. So leaving, uh, leaving Dakar then, the next uh, stop was to fly to Marrakech, which took us over the part of the Sahara Desert and through a mountain range called the Atlas Mountains, and then through them into the town of Marrakech, which was in the sunny, beautiful area of Morocco. And that I'll never forget either, because once again, uh, I plotted the course, and daylight, I basically went to sleep. And when I paid more attention to where we were, it seemed to me that when I looked at the maps, that we really weren't where we were. This wasn't looking at the stars, it was looking at the maps, it was looking at mountains and then fixes on the map. And so I found that I had made a mistake, and instead of taking the deviation between true north and magnetic north and adding it, I had subtracted it. So I was basically twice as far off the course as, as I should have been. So again, I didn't notify anybody else. I made a correction, and the correction worked, and the correction took us into the mountain pass and through the Atlas Mountains and uh, into Morocco. So again, navigation was working. What I had been taught, I was able to practice, and I was now becoming relatively confident. So the last thing was to go out into the, from Morocco into the Atlantic up past Portugal and into Presswick, Scotland and to land there. And that was a long trip and the gas was a factor. But that went, uh, and that was at night, and that was uneventful until we got to Presswick and then there was fog and there was drizzle and rain and it was difficult to get clearance to come in. And one plane ran out of gas in front of us and crashed but uh, we did have enough gas, and the pilot landed the airplane, and that was it. They took the plane from us, and that we didn't expect. And they put us on a train and sent us to a reassignment center for the 8th Air Force in England. So we lost our plane, which we had named Myrtle the Fertile Turtle. That was the first disappointment, that the plane that we thought was going to be ours for our missions was not going to be ours. At the rehabil rehabilitation center, there were people... Can I go ask you a question? How did you ever come up with a name like that? I did. And the reason, the reason I did it was very simple. People were talking in terms of uh, girlfriends or wives and things mm -hmm. like that. And, of course, the head of the crew was Joe, and he didn't have a girlfriend, and he didn't have a wife. And he wasn't interested in doing that. And so I said, let's give it a girl's name. Uh, the B-24 is a very slow, lumbering mm -hmm. type of thing, and like a turtle. And so let's call it Myrtle the Turtle. And the Fertile Turtle came because it carried the biggest bomb load of any of the four engine bombers. So we called it Myrtle, as a girl, the Fertile Turtle. Did you decorate the nose at yes. all? Yes. We didn't put a picture on it. We just uh -huh. put Myrtle, the uh -huh. Fertile Turtle. Okay. No, there, there were no sex, there were no breasts, uh, there, there yeah. were none of the yeah. stuff that was on most of the other, other airplanes. So... At the uh, center where crews were then assigned to establish bomb groups, we waited, and finally we got our assignment. And our assignment was to the 93rd bomb group, and it was stationed at a little town about 20 miles south of Norwich in the East Anglia section of uh, England, which is where most of the heavy bombers were stationed. They were stationed in a radius of about 50 miles from Norwich in the northeastern part of England. It was easier for all of them to form, get up together, and, and, and go out on a mission together. When we got there, we learned two things. That our airplane was going to be an old airplane that had survived 25 missions. Oh, by the way, our mission toll was we were assigned to do 25 missions and promised if we completed 25 missions. This is the early part of the war. This is now late 43, early 44 that if we completed 25 missions, we would be able to go home and become instructors for new cadets who were learning uh, about combat. So we did the math at that point in time, and we were losing airplanes at the rate of 5 to 10 percent every mission. And uh, the actual math worked out that most people either got wounded, killed, or captured on their eighth mission. So we got this old airplane called the Judith Lynn, which was, had no nose turret, just had two flexible machine guns. 
that the navigator used on both sides or the bombardier if he wasn't at the bomb site. But it had been a lucky ship because it had completed 25 missions. So that was our, <coughs> that was our first shock, that we had an old airplane and that we were the 93rd Bomb Group, which, by the way, was nicknamed Ted's Traveling Circus. And the reason for that is it had moved from England to Africa to make African raids on Ploesti and the Romanian oil fields and back to England and back to Africa. And so it was called the Traveling Circus. That takes me up, I guess, to uh, what is the moment of truth, and that is the first mission. And the first mission is one you never forget because it starts with a wake-up call. When people talk about, we got a wake-up call at uh, Pearl Harbor, we got a wake-up call at 9-11, uh, that's nothing like a real wake-up. A real wake-up call starts in the 8th Air Force with a hand on your shoulder while you're sleeping in a little cot in a cold Quonset hut. And at 3.30, the hand shakes you and it says, you're going to fly today, it's time to get up. And so you get up at 3.30 in the morning and you go to a coal stove and you try and find water to shave because you have to be clean shaven in order to have the oxygen mass, mass fit closely when you're up high in the air. So your wake-up call starts with a soldier waking you up, being shaved, and then going having breakfast, and then going to a briefing room. Probably by this time it's 4.30 to 5. And there you're locked in in a secret way. And the map that's in front of you is covered by the commanding officer and the intelligence officer up front. And they unfold the map to show you where you're going and what the route is. So now you find out what your first mission is. In my case, it was Nuremberg, which was very far inside Germany, where later, of course, the Nuremberg trials were. But it also was the home of an industrial uh, city right next to it called Firth, which was manufacturing ball bearings. So this was our first mission. So you get up, you get dressed, you put on your electric flying suit, put on your heavy clothes after that. The navigators go in and get a special briefing. And navigators then plan their course. Then you go to the airplane, and you get in the airplane by 7 o'clock. You look for the weather. It's either raining or it's drizzled. It's never, it's never clear in, in the morning in England or snowing. And you wait to know whether actually you're going to take off, because many times the operation is what they call scrubbed. If it never takes off, it's called scrub. If it takes off and then for some reason the weather isn't right, it's called abortion. So in most cases you're waiting to see whether the mission is scrubbed, that it never takes off. And so we waited. And fortunately on our first mission, the mission did take off. There's nothing worse than really getting prepared for a mission and then having to go back again knowing you're going to have to start over again the next day. So on that first mission you, f you get, you understand the power that is basically there and it really is overwhelming. It makes you feel terrific because all of a sudden there's a B-24 going down the runway and only gets halfway down and another one starts going down the runway and then you start going down. So at, at one time there's three B-24s going down the runway together, one taking off, one halfway down and you starting. And this sense of power as you come down and lift off with four tons of bombs is really overwhelming. And from then you work your way through the clouds and come up above. And up above there's an airplane with a big yellow body on it, and usually zebra stripes, which tells you that's the, that's the plane you're going to form on. It doesn't fly with you. It just circles up here until your formation and all of you get into formation ready to go. And then you're on your way over the channel. And this sense of power on your first mission, it, it really is overwhelming. You have every reason to have been happy that you made this decision and that you're in a bomber and you've got all these other hundreds and hundreds of bombers with you. And then you have air cover. And usually in those days it lasts with you for maybe 50 to 100 miles over the coast. And then they run out of gas and they have to go back and there is no air cover and that's when the German Luftwaffe, the German fighters, would begin to attack the formations as they come in. And then you begin to see the loss of, of your power because you look and you see it, you see airplanes on either side of you being shot, being on fire, going down, or you yourself 
experience that. Fortunately, we did not on our first mission. We did not experience any uh, firepower that hit us directly. But I did see planes going down that were in formation with us. So the mission was long. Uh, the mission was successful. We hit the target. Everything worked. We came back. Uh, and we landed. And it was a very powerful experience. When you come back, however, the letdown is tremendous. There really isn't much to look forward to except doing it again, and you really don't want to do it again. I mean, you wanted to do it, you experienced it, and it's terrific. But to have to do it another 24 times, knowing what you've seen, is not something you really do look forward to. So in between missions, the, the uh, sort of paradox is that you're at death's door, and the next night, you're down at a British pub uh, drinking yourself silly because you're not going to have to fly the next day. You're with other flyers, British, free poles, and you're having a great time. So from that experience you learn maybe today is the day you're going to live or today is the day you're going to die. And so most people drank a lot when they weren't flying. And so alcohol became pretty much a way of life in the Air Force for people who were not on missions. I won't bore you with the other missions, but we did make the first three missions on Berlin. And March 6, 1944 was referred to as Bloody Monday because we sent 600 airplanes up and 69 did not come back. Uh, though this was not the worst experience that I had because our group <coughs> was not uh, basically uh, damaged in any significant way. An awful lot of other groups were, but we were not, so we were fortunate. But on my eighth mission, we flew to Friedrichsberg, Friedrichshaven, which is on Lake Constance, southern part of Germany, on the Swiss border. And it was there that just as we went over the target, we were going through this. I must tell you a little bit about flak. You've heard the word flak. Mm -hmm. And I, I've carried this ever since because this is what flak looks like. This is a piece of a German. 88 artillery shell, which is fired from the ground and explodes at 25,000 feet where we were. We flew at about 25,000 feet. And it's a shell like this, about this long, and it's time to explode and destroy the engines or the airplane or blow up the gas tanks. And on my eighth mission, just after we were going through this field of flak where you could see these black clouds all actually pinpointing you that you had to fly through, just as we hit the target, and the bombardier released the bombs. I hit which was called the salvo handle. It was a handle right next to uh, the instrument on the navigation table. And what it did was it released all the bombs in the event that the bomb site did not release the bombs. So that they then all went So you had a bomb site on board. You had a bomb site and the bombardier was then dropping the bombs, said bombs are away. The minute he said bombs are away, the navigator hit the salvo handle, which meant if they were hung up and didn't go, they would automatically go from a salvo. And as I hit that salvo, this piece of flak nearly took my right arm off. And all I felt was no pain. It just felt like somebody had hit me with a sledgehammer. I felt total peace. And it was the most unbelievable experience I ever had in my life. I didn't talk to God. I didn't see God. But I had absolutely no fear. And I was totally at peace. And I looked down. And there wasn't much left of my right arm. It was sort of hanging there. I called and asked Joe to send somebody down, put a tourniquet on. Meanwhile, I was checking the instruments because now we're on our way back and navigating was part of what I had to do. And I was capable of doing it. I had no problem with it. The radio operator came down, took one look at it, and fainted. And so I had to call again, and the engineer came down. He revived the radio operator, sent him back with his portable action mask, and he put the tourniquet on and stayed with me for the uh, three or four hours that we did coming back. The plane was on fire. Uh, Joe put the uh, engine, which was on fire, out on the way back. We lost a second engine. Brought it back. He landed it. And uh, I was taken to the hospital. And my uh, arm was repaired. I was uh, told later I was uh, eight hours under the, on the operating table. And then I was, uh, didn't come to for 72 hours afterwards due to an overdose of uh, pedithol, which was the drug they used in those days. 
They flew. Oh, was that piece of flak? That oh, piece what, of flak? This piece of flak was in the instrument panel, uh -huh. and it had a piece of my wire suit and blood on it. In other words, it took this part of my arm and went in and, and demolished part of the instrument panel. Mm -hmm. So while I was in the hospital and the plane had 150 holes in it, my crew was given a leave to go to London and relax. And Joe came and brought this piece of flak to me and said to me, Sorry you're so unlucky, Navigator, but we're going to miss you. Because I was in no way going to be able to fly again. And then they went on leave and they came back to fly the repaired airplane and they flew and they never came back. The crew next to them saw them explode in the air, just like the shuttle did on my 65th birthday. And uh, they were declared missing. One parachute was seen coming out. And uh, for years they were declared missing. And for years I assumed that they were missing, rather than the fact that they were killed. Uh, about two years later the government declared them killed in action. But up until about four years ago, through a German internet source, there was no bodies ever recovered. There was no indication of, of anything other than the fact that they just didn't return. Mm -hmm. And four or five years ago, through a German internet, I found they had been discovered by the Germans and they were buried in a small German-occupied cemetery just north of Paris. But there were only body parts and only one piece of the wing that was found, which had a star on it. Well, that was their identification. So they are buried in a little town north uh, west of Paris. So that was the end of my combat career. My arm was put together by a doctor who, uh, through fate, I met 30 years later. When my hand started to contract again, I was sent to see him as an orthopedic man and sitting across from him like I am with you. He had questioned me where I was when this happened, and he was the doctor that put my hand back together again. He was the only doctor in the hospital that just opened up the week before I was shot. Matter of fact, this is a book in which my story is in, in which his story is in also, called High Honor, published by Smithsonian. And it is the story of 28 different people who played a part in the air war against Germany and Japan. So when I came out of the service, that would be, uh, when I came back from combat, I was sent to a rehabilitation center in Pauling, New York. And there we had the company of people like Lowell Thomas, the famous commentator, uh, John Dewey, Norman Vincent Peale, uh, who came over and played the softball with us. And here we were with missing legs, missing arms, all kinds of problems, and they were called the 9-0 men. And so this was a wonderful, you know, wonderful part of uh, convalescing. And uh, they were great people. From there, I was then uh, sent back to uh, San Marcos as a uh, instructor, uh, first to uh, uh, Monroe Field in, uh, in Louisiana. And all of us there would uh, devote our time and energy to trying to tell people that what they learned in school would take them only so far. But what they needed to learn in combat was how to operate under conditions which were not classroom. And that's where we made our major contribution before most of those people were sent to Japan or sent to Guam and the islands of Okinawa that bombed Japan. I had enough points to get out, so in September of 1945 I was uh, sent to Fort Dix, close to my home in New York City, and that was the end of my Air Force career. I resigned my commission at the beginning of the Korean War. I no longer felt that I was uh, young enough, capable enough to keep up with the modern technology to be of use to the government in Korea. And uh, so I resigned my commission. Do you uh, recall your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Uh, yes. Uh, when you're talking about uh, 1945, I was, um, I was teaching and I was uh, an instructor in, uh, I think, Houston at the time on a special assignment. Having been a, I must tell you this, having been a peacenik before the war, in other words, I would never have gone to war uh, unless we had been attacked by Germany. I had studied enough about World War I and understood that there was no way in the world that America should get trapped into another European war with France and Britain, who had allowed Hitler to uh, uh, build himself into a, into a dictator over ten years. So I was, oh, I was always an America first peacenik type of person. Lindbergh was one of my heroes. He was saying, let's take care of America first. So this is, this is what my politics were. Pearl Harbor changed it. 
So when I went to war and went to work with Roosevelt, I was doing that, you know, from a family who thought that my father thought Roosevelt was probably the worst thing that ever happened to America because the, the free enterprise system was going to go down the pike. And I would have tremendous arguments with him and say, but Dad, look, the banks are closed and the Republicans haven't done a thing. This guy's doing something. So I had a fondness for him. So when he died, uh, I was relieved because I was very aware of the fact that he was a very ill man. And uh, I learned to have a tremendous respect for Harry Truman, who I really didn't know anything about prior to Roosevelt's death. But yes, I was in Houston, and I remember it. And I remember uh, thinking that, you know, thank God he lived to the point where we know the war has been won. And he did know that. And I knew that. Uh -huh. What was your reaction to the uh, dropping of the bombs on Japan? I think all of us who had been in combat uh, felt that Harry Truman did the right thing. Uh, I was aware of the fact that uh, even what Einstein had said, who had been one of my heroes growing up in school, I was taught his theory of relativity in the 30s, so I had an understanding of this mind that he had. And even though he was the one that kept saying, you know, you have no idea what you're doing when you set out this, uh, this, this weapon, it's something beyond anybody's wildest imagination. I still think that politically at that point in time, rather than trying to send people to occupy Japan knowing that they would have fought as they did on the islands to the last man, uh, would have been unconscionable as the number of Americans that would have been killed. And I had to put it in proportion, and this is the things that young people, including my own children who are in their 50s, don't understand. That when I dropped bombs on Berlin or on these cities, I understood that not only did we hit our target, but that we killed hundreds of thousands of women and children. But at the same time, there were nights when I wasn't bombing Germany, that I sat in a bomb shelter in England with a woman and her child right next to me while the Germans were dropping bombs on England. So I saw it both ways. I was in a bomb shelter seeing the horror that those women went through with those men and remembered that Hitler had done this for a year on England without any protection whatsoever and without hitting a target. He had just leveled London. He had just leveled Coventry. So that in doing what I did, it seemed that what I was trapped in was the fact that war in today's world has nothing to do with soldiers, it has to do with civilizations and cultures, and whatever it takes is what the president or what anybody has to do. So I came down on the thought that, that Harry Truman made the right decision, one that I would have made. And I would have taken the bomb if I had been the navigator. I would have had no problem delivering the bomb. Did you uh, ever remain in contact with anyone else? I know your crew was lost, but anyone else that you served with? After the I did not for that reason. There was no reunion uh, reason to go. I had lost my crew, and it was something I didn't talk about for many years. And so I had no desire to go back and share the so-called memories with a crew that had survived. And it wasn't until much later uh, when I decided to do this for reasons that would be helpful to young people and understanding what what World War II was like, not to study it in its entirety, but no individual stories of people and how it affected their lives. It wasn't until then that I uh, uh, ba basically had any real reason to try and recapture people who had been there. And then I joined what is called the 8th Air Force Historical Society. Okay. And through that, I have maintained contacts both at the national level and at the local level in, the, in the New York City. Okay. And found that very rewarding. Did you ever join any other veterans organizations? No, American only Legion. I never joined the Legion or the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? No. How about I, when I came back, remember, I was already married, yes, and, I, and yes. I also had a mother and a grandmother uh -huh. to support. My father had died, so I went back to work and worked as hard as I could to progress as fast as I could, and I progressed pretty rapidly to a pretty important position. So, so. did you ever use the 5220 Club? No. Never used that? Okay. No, I th well, did you get to see any uh, USO shows while you were in England? <clears throat> One that I, I'll never forget this because it shows the USO. My sister married a very well-to-do person, a matter of fact, his name was Bill Menon of the Men in Shaving Fortune. And they were at 21 uh, one night where they sponsored television, uh, early television shows, and, uh, uh, and met uh, the uh, uh, celebrities. 
and they had dinner one night with George Raff, who at that time I had known was connected to the Mafia and was, had no respect for whatsoever. And he wrote me and told me that he was coming over and they had given me his name to look up because he was, he was, he was going to come and spend some time with me. And I wrote back and said, I don't think he wants to do it to begin with, but tell him I won't miss it whatsoever. No, I never was a, never was a present in a USO show. How do you think uh, your time in the military changed or affected your life? I think in a very uh, dominant way. I've mentioned part of it. The, the moment the truth comes to you in which uh, when people talk about religion and, and believing in something. Uh, I was raised in a, a school which was connected to the, the Christian church. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I don't go to church anymore. Uh, but I do have the faith that came to me as I told you when this piece of flag hit me. There was no question in my mind that I was coming home. I was going to be safe. Just go to work and do the job I had to do. It was a feeling that has stayed with me all my life. And so from that standpoint, uh, there is no fear. I mean, so many people seem to be today uh, afraid of so many different things. The fear that I had of doing things or fear of failing has never, never, never been with me since I came out of the service. So I have continued to try and look at my own life as being one of, uh, of missions, Can I continue to uh, live life as a series of uh, missions, not just adventures. And uh, it's worked for me. And as I look at it today, oh, I'm talking about faith and, and, and today's, after the war, I was lucky enough later in my life to be able to open my own business on Madison Abbey, advertising, marketing, and public relations. And I started with the Milton Bradley Company, which was a big game company, Game of Life, et cetera, and made them very successful. And in my second account, I had the opportunity to make a presentation to BMW Motorcycles and Cars. Now, this is a German car, Bavarian Motor Works in Munich. And 34 agencies made presentations. And I flew to Munich to meet the head of uh, the managing director of BMW. And in talking with him after I made the presentation, he said, where were you during the war? And I said, I was in the 8th Air Force bombing Germany. And he said to me, I want to show you what you, what you did to Munich. And he drove me out in the BMW to the park and he said, we had to bulldoze all of Munich out here and it just raised everything. And I said, I said, you know what that is? He looked at it and he said, yeah, German 88. I said, yes. I said, this went into my right arm, took almost my right arm, and another one on the following mission went into my airplane, and my whole crew blew up. He looked at me and he said, you see this missing earlobe? American 50 caliber, machine gun bullet. From then on, we would drink together, and he would say to me, we should have been on the same side. The Russians were the enemy. <laughs> and I would say, but you had a little guy with a mustache named Hitler. And he would say, what could we do? We had Hitler and you had Roosevelt. See, in his mind, it made no difference. You had to do what your leader said. We had Roosevelt and he had Hitler. Anyway, he became a good friend. I did get the account. It became very successful. Uh, I drove the first BMW, brought it in from Munich for $2,300, drove it to Maine, had it at 105 wrote the marketing plan, and you know the rest. We just increased the price and the power over the last years. And the other thing I might mention to you, working with a game company, Milton Bradley, later I did a consulting job and had to go to Tokyo. And in dealing in uh, the creation of electronic games, this is back in the 70s when this was an idea which was, uh, had not uh, materialized, I met in one marketing company dealing with the uh, executive board, a man who later socialized with me, Japanese, and he told me that he was the last kamikaze pilot. And I said, what do you mean you were the last kam kamikaze pilot for your viewers? Was a, uh, was a Japanese suicide uh, bomber who got in an airplane and then dove it uh, directly into a battleship or whatever the target could be. He said, on, it turned out it was the last day of the war, and he said, my assignment was to go sink this battleship or aircraft carrier, and he said, I got halfway there and decided I would go back and say I didn't have enough fuel, and he said, I got back and the war was over. <laughs> he was 17. So I met an SS trooper who was the head of BMW, had been an SS trooper, and I met the last kamikaze pilot in my business career afterwards. 
So it, it, it's been a fun trip. But, but then when you said, how is it affected? In 1972, when I retired from business, the war then became the war on drugs. Nixon declared war on cancer and war on drugs in 1972. And I became aware of how our basic young people were being destroyed by drugs and had been destroyed by drugs starting in the 60s. But by the 70s, it was uh, through all of the high schools, both in New York and Maine and nationally. And so most of my effort has been talking with people in the school systems, both here, private, public school, and creating opportunities for, for young people to find some kind of career guidance. So that, that's my current war. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, we're rolling again. Let me put my glasses on so I can read. The, the one fader I have at 82 is that I can't read very well without them. When I work with the young people, both in the public school system and in the uh, private school system, colleges and high schools, and in the lower grades, I try and use the book High Honor in covering not only the war, but what it really means, the word honor. And in the preface of the book, we have included the statement, which is the final sentence of the Declaration of Independence. And what the Founding Fathers said was this, and I read it. And for the support of this declaration, with the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And it's that word, I think, that is difficult to define, to define but awfully easy to understand when you read it in relationship to what the Founding Fathers said when they signed the Declaration of Independence. And in my, uh, my own chapter, in which I talk further about the drug problem and why the war on drugs is so vital to the future of this country, it is entitled Power of Time. And in that chapter, there's a picture of me and my crew. Okay, can you... Uh, taken in 1943. Would you like to name the whole crew if you could? Or, sure. Or just... Okay. This is Johnny Johnson, Thad Johnson, who was the co uh, who No, this is uh, uh, Frank Caldwell. Let me put my glasses on. This is Frank Caldwell, who was the bombardier and came from Anderson, Indiana. This is the co-pilot, Johnny Johnson, who came from Houston, Texas. This was my greatest friend, Joe Rosas, the pilot, who came from Hollywood, California. And this is me, from New York City. This is Wally Walden, who came from Houston, Texas. He was a waste gunner. This was the other waste gunner. Ed McHugh, came from Montana. Ed Miller, came from Wyoming. He was the tail gunner. This is Dinkins, we called him Dink. Frank was his first name, he was the engineer. I'll skip this one and go to this one. This is Rosie. He came from Tennessee. He could shoot a squirrel or a German fighter pilot from his shoulder or from his waist. It didn't make any difference. He, had un he was our ball tower gunner. This young man, is the young, his name was Percival. He was the radio operator. He's the one that came to try and fix my arm and couldn't handle what he saw and fainted. And he failed to go on that last mission. He had had enough. And the thing that haunts me is that I don't know the face of this guy, but the guy who came and replaced him was an 18-year-old Jewish boy by the name of Henry Vogelstein from Brooklyn. It was his first and last mission. And when you think about it, an 18-year-old boy into a replacement crew, he didn't know the crew. We were, quote, an all-Christian crew. And by that I mean we all had a little New Testament that the Air Force gave us as we were listed as Christians. So they gave people who listed themselves as Christian a little New Testament. They gave the Jewish people an Old Testament. So this young man, whose face I do not know, made his first and last mission with a crew that he had never met. That's bravery. So when I usually sum it up with the young people that I talk to, I say we all want to be free, but very few of us want to be brave. And the real answer is for all of us to be free, a few must be brave. And that's the history of America. Okay. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much. This, by the way, uh, Mike is an unusual guy that I met afterwards for the 8th Air Force. This guy was on Walter Cronkite's program at one time. His life can't be true. He flew 75 missions. He flew 25, re-enlisted for 25 more, was never touched, re-enlisted again to the end of the war. He flew 75 missions and was never shot. Wow. <laughs> Okay, thank we, you. We okay, go ahead. When you talked about <coughs> various air forces and how many they lost, the 8th Air Force did have the highest fatality rate of any so-called operating force. They had over 50,000 people who were either wounded, killed, or POW. And this was just the 8th Air Force who flew over Germany. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.